worldwide, the National Association of Underwater Instructors presents Scuba Diver, a comprehensive video that describes the gear, skills, and basic concepts of scuba diving. This program will help you learn about scuba diving. Although it can supplement training, it cannot take the place of a complete training program. Responsible participation in recreational scuba diving requires that you demonstrate the necessary knowledge and skills and be evaluated by a qualified NAWI instructor. When you see the Take a Note icon, stop the program and jot down the information. It forms the basis for the final test. When you see the Open Book icon, stop the program and complete the corresponding questions or exercises in the NAWI workbook. You'll be amazed at how easy it will be to earn your NAWI certification and qualify to begin a lifelong underwater adventure. Chapter 1 Introduction What is scuba diving? Scuba stands for self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. You scuba dive with a compressed air cylinder that you wear on your back. The air is supplied to your mouth through a regulator that reduces the high pressure inside the tank to the same pressure as the water surrounding you. Your NAWI Scuba Diver Certification course will teach you the fundamentals of diving. You will learn the principles of selecting and operating your equipment and the effects of diving on your body. Once you've completed the course and your open water certification dives, you'll be qualified to dive in conditions similar to those in which you did your open water certification dives. Your NAWI Scuba Diver Certification is just the beginning of your adventures in diving. It's your license to learn more about the underwater world. As in any sport, there are risks involved with scuba diving. Most dives are very easy. However, on every dive, there is always a chance that you will need to exert yourself greatly. At times, diving can be strenuous. This is particularly true if you dive in cold water, in strong currents, or make beach entries through surf. As a diver, you need to recognize that risks exist and you must be willing to accept this risk and take responsibility for your own actions. You will be asked to sign an express assumption of risk associated with diving and related activities, which explains the risks of diving. In the case of minors, parents will have to sign your waiver and medical history form. To engage in diving, you must have a sound heart and healthy lungs, have clear ears and sinuses, be free of any limiting disease or serious ailment, and be free of any condition that can cause unconsciousness. Also, women that are pregnant should not dive. You will be asked to complete a medical history form before you can participate in the water sessions. If you indicate any problems that might affect your ability to dive, you'll be asked to have a medical exam and obtain written medical approval. You also must be fit to dive. Initially, this means that you must have good aquatic ability. Good health and fitness are important for diving safety, but use of drugs can lead to problems underwater. Substances such as alcohol, marijuana, and cocaine should never be used before diving. Avoid taking any over-the-counter or prescription drugs that recommend not operating machinery. If you are ill and do not feel well enough to dive without taking a drug, you should not dive, even if you feel fine with medication. The effects of drugs can be changed by pressure in unpredictable ways. Medication can mask the symptoms of your illness, but that illness still exists. Chapter 2. Diving Equipment you will need the following personal items to start your NAWI Scuba Diver Certification course. Mask, snorkel, booties, fins, and gloves. You can go skin diving under optimal conditions with four pieces of gear. Mask, fins, snorkel, and flotation device. Because you wear most pieces of dive gear directly on your body, the comfort and fit of each item is extremely important. A scuba mask places a layer of air between your eyes and the water enabling you to see underwater objects clearly. The air pressure inside the mask is equalized with the water pressure outside when you exhale air from your nose into the mask. The most important consideration when you select a mask is whether the mask fits your face. To check for fit, place the mask gently against your face, inhale briefly, and hold your breath. If the mask does not fall off when you look down, it's a good fit. You can choose many different styles of masks. 
Essential features to look for include a solid frame to hold the lens in position, a tempered glass lens to help resist breaking, thus avoiding injury, an adjustable, split, or wide head strap that fits over a wide portion of your head. The ability to block off your nose to help equalize the pressure in your ears. And a double feather edge seal to help the mask fit to your face. A snorkel enables you to breathe normally while you watch the beauty beneath you. The snorkel helps you conserve energy and the air in your scuba cylinder anytime you are swimming on the surface. The basic snorkel is a J-shaped tube with a mouthpiece at the curved end. The two most important things to consider when selecting your snorkel are comfort and breathing ease. The mouthpiece must fit comfortably in your mouth and should not be twisted when you place the tube or barrel of the snorkel over your left ear. The snorkel should be between 30 and 35 centimeters or 12 to 14 inches tall. If it's too short, it will constantly fill with water, and if too long, it will be harder to get a good breath of air. There are many other options that can be added to the basic snorkel. Booties provide protection and warmth for your feet. They also serve as shoes when you walk around a dive boat or dive scene. Booties are made from neoprene, which is a synthetic rubber injected with gas. The tiny gas cells in the rubber provide insulation for your feet. The booty should also have a sole to protect the bottom of your foot from rocks and rough surfaces. Fins provide a means to move yourself through the water. Once you have all of your scuba gear on, it is difficult and awkward to use your hands and arms to move through the water. There are two types of fins, full foot fins and heel strap fins. Full foot fins are typically used for snorkeling and in warm water, your entire foot is enclosed in the foot pocket of the fin. Heel strap fins also have a foot pocket, but the back of the pocket is open and an adjustable strap goes across the opening. You must wear booties with heel strap fins to protect your feet from blisters. You can use heel strap fins for diving in any temperature water. Fins come in many different materials and styles. The important thing is to select fins that are right for you. Gloves protect your hands from cuts and scrapes and provide warmth in cold water. They can be made of cotton, a thin nylon material, or thin neoprene. Your gloves should fit snugly and allow you to move your fingers easily. You must be able to handle your equipment while wearing gloves. Divers should wear some sort of personal flotation device for snorkeling and skin diving. The most commonly used is an inflation vest that is worn in the chest. Maintaining your basic gear is simple. You should rinse your gear with fresh water after every diving day. Be sure that you do not leave your gear in the sun any more than necessary because sunlight and heat are extremely damaging to scuba gear and neoprene. When most people think of scuba diving, they immediately think of the cylinders that divers wear on their backs. Scuba tanks allow you to store large amounts of air in a small space. The air in a scuba cylinder is highly compressed. The pressure of cylinders ranges from 120 bar or 1800 psi to 310 bar or 4500 psi. Most cylinders are made of aluminum or steel. Aluminum cylinders do not rust, which is an advantage over steel cylinders. However, aluminum cylinders are more easily damaged on the outside and on the threads where the cylinder valve screws in and must be inspected regularly for cracks. Steel cylinders are more resistant to exterior damage. However, if water enters a steel cylinder, the cylinder corrodes and forms rust that can quickly ruin a cylinder. Scuba cylinders come in many different sizes. Markings are placed on the shoulder of each cylinder to provide important information about the cylinder. The serial number of the cylinder, the name of the manufacturer or their symbol, government required marks to signify that the cylinder was manufactured according to its standards, the service pressure of the cylinder, which is the pressure to which the cylinder can be filled, a plus mark on steel tanks authorizing a 10% pressure overfill beyond the stamped service pressure, the material of which the cylinder is composed, and the hydrostatic testing date of the cylinder. In the U.S., hydrostatic testing must be performed every five years or whenever the cylinder must be cleansed by tumbling. In Japan, every three years. Australia, every year. Each cylinder must have a valve to hold the air in the cylinder when it's not in use. K-valves are the most common type of valve found in the United States. 
The first stage regulator yoke fits over the post and the regulator is tightened against the post with a screw. You open the valve by turning the knob counterclockwise and close it by turning the knob clockwise. An O-ring on the cylinder valve makes a seal between the regulator and the valve. You should replace O-rings frequently because of wear. The DIN valve has a large threaded opening and the regulator screws into the opening. The DIN valve is stronger and capable of operating at pressure higher than 200 bar or 3000 psi. Every cylinder valve is equipped with a pressure relief disc or burst disc. The relief mechanism is necessary to keep the cylinder from rupturing if it becomes extremely hot or otherwise overpressurized. Scuba cylinders must be inspected at least once per year at a professional dive shop or a dive equipment repair facility by a certified cylinder inspector. The cylinder is inspected for dents, marring, and fire or heat discoloration on the outside and for corrosion, water, and cracks inside. If the cylinder passes the visual inspection, a visual inspection sticker is attached to the cylinder. You should store cylinders for any long term with some pressure in the cylinder. In steel tanks, keeping some air in your cylinder ensures that water cannot enter your cylinder and cause corrosion. Aluminum tanks can be stored empty with the valves open so that they will not be a hazard in fire. You should store cylinders upright in a cool and protected location where they cannot be knocked over. Your scuba regulator delivers air to you on demand and provides easy breathing underwater. In the first stage, the high pressure air from the cylinder is reduced to approximately 10 bar or 150 psi above the pressure surrounding the cylinder. The air from the first stage is then delivered to the second stage through a low pressure hose. The first stage of your regulator has a number of outlets or ports to which hoses and pieces of equipment are attached. The first stage must have at least one high pressure port. This port bypasses the mechanisms that reduce the pressure from the cylinder. Your submersible pressure gauge is attached to this port so you can monitor your air supply. The second stage of your regulator has a mouthpiece attached to it. The second stage further reduces the air pressure from approximately 10 bar or 150 psi above the surrounding pressure to whatever the ambient pressure is. Therefore, the air you breathe is always at the pressure needed by your body. Some regulators offer higher performance than others and deliver a greater volume of air at deeper depths regardless of flow restrictions. If you plan to learn to do deep diving or wreck, cave, or ice diving, or do underwater hunting, you will want a high performance regulator. It is standard practice that you and your buddy be equipped with alternate air sources in case of an emergency. The most common alternate air source is an octopus regulator. It's an additional second stage that allows you to share air from your cylinder with another diver. The hose for the octopus regulator should be at least 10 centimeters or 4 inches longer than a standard regulator hose. Another type of alternate air source is a combination regulator and power inflator for your buoyancy compensator. Contingency scuba or true alternate air sources provide a totally independent regulator and air supply. The pony bottle is a small scuba cylinder with a separate regulator. Another type is a small cylinder with an integrated first and second stage mounted directly on the cylinder. Contingency scuba provides an excellent backup for yourself if you and your buddy get separated underwater. However, it adds additional expense to your scuba equipment as well as extra bulk and weight. Divers must rely on gauges and instruments to tell them depth, bottom time, direction, and air supply. The gauges and instruments can be integrated into a console or worn separately. A dive console streamlines your gauges into one unit. The submersible pressure gauge, or SPG, is a required piece of equipment for scuba diving. It displays the amount of air pressure remaining in your scuba cylinder. By looking at your SPG frequently during your dive, you will know when your air supply is getting low and it is time to end your dive. SPGs are sensitive instruments and you should not subject them to a shock or abuse. In addition, some air-integrated computers can monitor your breathing rate and predict how long the air in your cylinder will last based on your breathing rate. Your depth and the duration of your dive at any particular depth are limited by a number of factors, so you need to monitor your depth with a depth gauge while diving. There are four types of depth gauges, capillary tube, Borden tube, diaphragm mechanism, and electronic gauge.
A capillary tube is very useful at shallow depths above 12 meters or 40 feet, but is not recommended for deeper depths. A Borden tube uses pressure to straighten a curved metal tube. Borden tubes measure depth reasonably accurately. A diaphragm mechanism uses a metal diaphragm which is attached to a linkage. As the pressure increases on the diaphragm, the needle moves to show your depth. Electronic depth gauges are part of all dive computers and most electronic dive timers. Electronic depth gauges are extremely accurate and reliable. You must have a means of recording the deepest depth you reach on a dive. Some gauges do not have a means of recording, so you must remember to record it on a slate during your dive. When you are swimming underwater and visibility is poor, a compass is an important instrument to have. A diving compass must be filled with liquid to withstand pressure and dampen needle movement underwater, have a reference or lubber line used as the direction of travel, and have means such as a rotating bezel to show a selected bearing or direction. Your regulator, alternate air source, and gauges are your life support system underwater and should be carefully maintained. You should replace the dust cap that fits over the inlet to the first stage whenever your regulator is off a cylinder. At the end of each diving day, you should rinse your regulator with fresh water to remove salt crystals or other impurities. Always be sure to let water run through the mouthpiece and exhaust tees on the second stage. At least once per year, you should have your regulator serviced by a certified repair technician. During an annual service, the repair technician will also inspect your submersible pressure gauge and high-pressure hose, depth gauge, and compass for proper operation. Along with keeping track of your depth underwater, you must also keep track of the time you stay underwater. You can do this by using a watch, an underwater timer, or a dive computer. Watches used for diving should be rated for depths of at least 100 meters or 300 feet. It should also be able to measure elapsed time with either a rotating bezel or a stopwatch feature. A typical dive computer records or displays maximum depth, current depth, actual dive time, and remaining allowable dive time. A buoyancy compensator, or BC, enables you to control whether you float on the surface of the water, hover in the water, or sink to the bottom. You control this by adding air or venting air from your BC. By controlling the amount of air in your BC, you can precisely control your buoyancy, which is one of the most important skills you will learn as a diver. BCs must be equipped with an overpressurized relief valve to prevent damage to the BC from too much internal air pressure. The BC must also have an inflator-deflator hose that is at least 2 centimeters or 3 quarters inch in diameter. At the end of the inflator-deflator hose is a power inflator mechanism and a deflator oral inflator valve. The power inflator mechanism is attached to the regulator first stage with a low pressure hose. The power inflator mechanism enables you to add air to the BC directly from your cylinder by pushing a button. If your power inflator mechanism fails or you have no air in your cylinder, you can orally inflate your BC by pressing the deflator oral valve button and blowing into the mouthpiece at the same time. There are three types of BCs, back flotation, jackets, and horse collars. Back flotation systems are designed so that the entire bladder of the BC is behind you. This leaves your chest and waist uncluttered. Jacket-style BCs are the most popular buoyancy compensators. They are designed so that the bladder wraps from your back around to your waist. These BCs are comfortable, provide good trim underwater, and float you upright on the surface when your BC is inflated. The older horse collar design encircles your neck. You can use a horse collar for both skin and scuba diving. Some jacket style and back flotation BCs enable you to add weights directly to the BC instead of wearing them on a weight belt. The BC must have a means of allowing you quick release of the weights in case of an emergency. The best way to select a BC is to try on different models and see which one is the most comfortable for you. Also, the features and designs of the BC should match the type of diving you will be doing. You should rinse your BC internally and externally after each diving day. Salt water, dirty water, or chlorinated water inside your BC can cause damage. Every time you bleed air from your BC underwater, some water gets into the BC. Inflate the BC to allow it to dry completely. Store the BC in a cool, dry place with air in the bladder. 
Species must have their power inflator mechanism inspected once per year. You should also inflate your BC completely to check for leaks before each dive trip. You wear lead weights when diving to offset the buoyancy of your body, wetsuit, and other diving gear you are wearing. Most commonly, you will find lead molded into cylinders or blocks with slits to enable a weight belt to be threaded through the weight. Some of the larger blocks of lead are curved to fit the hip and are known as hip weights. Also, lead shot can be sewn into pouches of various sizes. This is known as soft weight. Soft weights conform to the shape of your hip and are more comfortable to wear. The simplest and most common weight belt is a 5 cm or 2 inch wide nylon web belt with a metal or plastic buckle. The weight keepers are used on this type of belt to keep weights from shifting on the belt. No matter what type of weight system you choose, you must have a means of ditching the weights with one hand. This type of system is known as quick release. Anytime the water temperature is colder than your skin temperature, your body will lose heat to the water. Divers must wear a thermal protection diving suit in all but the warmest of waters. It is essential to wear the right thermal protection for the conditions where you dive. When you grow cold underwater, you lose your ability to perform at your best. Heat loss underwater affects your ability to think, and you fatigue rapidly. Cold water is a contributing factor in many diving accidents. It is essential to wear what feels right for you rather than what someone tells you to wear. In the warmest tropical waters, you might be able to dive in just a skin suit. In colder water, you will need a wetsuit. In the coldest waters, dry suits are the most effective form of thermal insulation. Dive suits also protect you from cuts, scrapes, and stings. Even if the water isn't cold, you should wear some type of protective covering to avoid injuries and sunburn. To determine what kind of dive skin you are buying, it is important to ask what materials are used to make the suit. Two common materials are Lycra and PolarTech. By themselves, Lycra dive skins provide minimal thermal protection. Lycra dive skins, like wetsuits, provide almost no protection from the wind, especially when wet. Dive suits of PolarTech provide the warmth of a thin neoprene wetsuit without the need to wear as much weight to compensate for the buoyancy of the suit. Wetsuits are made from neoprene, which is a synthetic rubber filled with thousands of tiny gas bubbles. Neoprene provides good insulation in many diving situations. Wetsuits are the most widely used thermal protection for divers because of their simplicity and relatively low initial cost. To work properly, a wetsuit must fit your body quite precisely and snugly. Once you enter the water, a thin layer of water is trapped between your skin and the inner surface of your suit. The water is then warmed to your skin temperature, and the insulating suit keeps you and the water warm. The thicker the wetsuit, the greater the insulation. The most popular thickness for warm water is 3 millimeters. In colder waters, most divers prefer a thickness of 7 millimeters or greater. Shorty wetsuits are popular in tropical waters, while in colder waters, Farmer John and a step-in jacket combination are used. Dry suits are preferred for colder water. Dry suits keep you dry by using a combination of a neck seal, wrist seals, and waterproof zipper. With some non-neoprene dry suits, you wear underwear under the suit to add insulation and keep you warm. The underwear traps air between your skin and the suit. We can place dry suits into two broad categories, neoprene suits and shell suits.